Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vishnu Malik, and I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, currently majoring in aerospace engineering. I'm here to present this morning on atmospheric spectroscopy, infrared photography, and solar corona photography from a high altitude ballooning platform. The high altitude ballooning team at the University of Minnesota is sponsored by the NASA Minnesota Space Scan Consortium. And it's a student run project with projects including atmospheric and weather studies, radiation studies, biological experiments, and currently we have a radio telemetry experiment and cosmic dust collection payload, which is getting ready for the summer. Space Flight with Ballooning is one of the freshman seminars that is offered to encourage freshmen to get involved with this project. As a freshman last year, I took this class and we were in a team of five people. And our objective for this class was to put together a scientific payload and launch it. And our experiments included atmospheric and weather studies, and we had a unique team experiment on infrared photography. The atmospheric and weather studies experiment was with the aim of studying and comparing red of humidity, pressure, and temperature values in different layers of the atmosphere. We used Hobo data loggers and BalloonSat Easy weather stations with flight computers for this. The infrared photography project was to test the validity of our hypothesis as a team which we made that infrared light could reveal more about the Earth's atmosphere and features than just visible light alone. For this, we used two Canon PowerShot programmable A570 cameras. The project was divided into three primary phases, which included the design and construction, launch and recovery, and data analysis and documentation. This is a photo here of the design and construction of the payload. Seen here is the flight computer. The components of the payload included a Paul Verhaeg balloon side easy flight computer with a near space weather station, a resistive heater, a hobo with a temperature sensor, and two cameras for visible light and infrared camera. In fact, I have my payload right here, just so you can see it. This here is the weather station on the outside, and we have the commit pin for the flight computer. So as soon as we are ready to launch, we pull the commit pin, and the flight computer starts recording data. On this side, we have our two cameras pointing outwards. One of them was the visible light camera, and the other one was the infrared camera. And both the cameras are programmed so as to take pictures at the same time. On the inside of the payload is the Hobo data logger, and here's our flight computer with the resistive heater. The construction material for this payload included foam core and insulated black foam, which is on the outside. And of course, as you can see, we used a lot of hot glue and strapping tape. And the rigging strings were attached through rigging tubes, which would be attached to the successive payload on the stack. The photography experiment revolved around the idea that infrared cameras would be more sensitive to, would capture a broader part of the spectrum than visible light because the infrared spectrum is beyond the visible light spectrum. So we could observe some features which could not be observed with a visible light camera. But this involved taking apart the camera and removing the visible light, the infrared light filter, and in that place attaching a visible light filter for the camera. So two programmable Canon power shots were used, and seen here is a picture of a toaster. And as you can see, the heating element is very prominent. And this was as a pre-flight test for the cameras. However, as the wavelength of the infrared light is more than visible light, we had some focusing issues, but still managed to take some great pictures and make some interesting conclusions. Since all our equipment and the instruments we used for the experiment, like the Hobo data sensors and the weather stations, and even the cameras were automated, we had to program them. The Hobo sensors took data every five seconds. The weather station took data every 15 seconds. 
and the cameras were programmed to take pictures every 30 seconds during the flight. This was the whole stack. So for the freshman seminar, we had four teams, and each of them had their individual experiments. The atmospheric experiments were kind of regular, but each of them had a unique experiment. And our unique experiment was the infrared camera. You can have a closer look at the. OK, I'll just point this out. But below the parachute is the Statostar unit, which was used for tracking. And the second payload from the bottom is the APRS tracking unit. So we had two tracking units. And the payload with a small balloon protruding out from a boomstick is actually one of the other team's experiments, which was to study the ideal gas law in different layers of the atmosphere. This was one of our ground tracking from Google Maps and provides a visual representation of the path our balloon took. So it went eastward and landed all the way in Holcomb, Wisconsin, after taking off from northeast of the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities. This photograph was taken by the visible light camera just seconds before it landed. And it's very common to land on the trees, and that's exactly what we did. So the payload box was actually recovered by one of the teaching assistants since it overshot its destination by 40 miles. And because we as freshmen had to get back to school at a certain time, one of uh, them offered to recover our payload. But we got to see it in class next week, and everything was working, no visible damage on the outside. And even then, even now, the payload is around eight months old. And as you can see, it's survived the trip, and it's in perfect condition. The next part of our project included the data analysis. And one of the things that were required for the data analysis was gathering everything out of the raw format and converting it to a presentable format for us to understand. One of the teaching assistants, Philip Hansen, who is proficient with the use of computers and programming flight computers, helped us with, helped us with this since we weren't very experienced with that. But he slowly gained on and put all our data in presentable Excel sheets and derived some graphs to study the variations in our experiments. The photographs were all compared, and the ones with the same timestamp were chosen to compare the different features. This is a graph for the altitude versus time. And it's very clear from this graph that the ascent was longer than the descent. And this was a pretty long flight, as our descent, ascent rate was pretty slow. And our balloon got up to 90,500 feet and ascended till around almost two hours. The pressure radiations had a general trend, and pressure decreased with an increase in altitude, which is reasonable as the air molecules have a, as the gravity has a much lesser effect on the air molecules. We did have some negative values of pressure, which could be because of incorrect calibration of the instruments. But otherwise, the general trend was very normal. The relative humidity variations were very, very irregular, which is reasonable because the payload goes through a lot of cloud layers. And as it goes through a cloud layer, the relative humidity values shoot up. But the general trend for this is that relative humidity decreases. Now, during the descent of the payload, there is a lag in the relative humidity values, which could be because of the payload carrying a stack of dry air as it descended and the pressure sensors unable to cope up with the increase in descent rate. The temperature variations followed a normal trend, too. And temperature went down to almost negative 46 Fahrenheit at 34,000 feet, and then continued to increase till the burst. The temperature change during the descent was much more drastic. And it's interesting to observe why such experiments always have a more drastic descent rate than ascent rate. And our team figured that that could be due to the wind chill factor, but other factors might be taken into consideration too when talking about that. So we compared all our infrared and visible light photos and tried to, sync, tried to get the ones which are synchronized together. Seen in these photos is a lake which is pointed out by the vertical arrow, and a freshly tilled soil field, which is pointed out by the horizontal arrow. 
And as you can see in the infrared image, it gives a very dark patch and it's very prominent, which could be because the lake and the freshly tilled soil is absorbing a lot of infrared light. Seen in this photo is the Mille Lacs Lake in Minnesota. The infrared photo gives a really dark patch compared to the visible light photo, which is like seeing through the haze. As our payload was noticed, took pictures of a cloud layer, the apparent thinness of the cloud layer is noticed in the infrared photos, which could be because a lot of the infrared light is absorbed by the atmosphere, which in turn leads to more higher penetrating power, whereas in the visible light, a lot of it is reflected by the cloud layer. This photo is again of the Mille Lacs Lake, and in the visible light photo, you can see that it's almost invisible to the naked eye, but the infrared photo captures it as a dark patch just again. These photos were taken minutes before the balloon burst at, at 88,000 feet. The upper reaches of the atmosphere seem to give off a distinct glow in the visible light photos, which is not present in the infrared photos, which again leads us to think that a lot of the infrared light penetrated well through the atmosphere. We came up with a summary of the six results, and the temperature values decreased till around 35,000 feet and then shot up till 90,000 feet. The atmospheric pressure decreased with an increase in altitude, and the relative humidity increased in areas where the cloud layers were found. And as you could see, the infrared layers could reveal some distinct features, such as water bodies in the atmosphere. Now, the University of Minnesota encourages research at the undergraduate level through its undergraduate research symposium, which in turn is the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Project. And this project is for aspiring freshmen who want to come up with their own project in the field of science and engineering. So what they do is they're given a proposal, and if that proposal gets accepted, they get funding from the University of Minnesota to do their project. Recently, my Europe project for atmospheric spectroscopy and solar corona photography got approved, and I am working on it this summer. My Europe project will attempt to take solar corona photographs and do spectrometry of the atmosphere using a home-built spectrometer. And this might require camera modifications and also the use of a telescope or an active point of mechanism in the direction of the sun for the cameras. The solar corona encircles the sun in the outer atmosphere and the temperatures in this region can reach up to 10 to the power 6 Kelvin, which is really high. And this is most visible from the Earth during a solar total eclipse. I've got a picture of that coming up. So in this picture, the moon acts like a shadow that keeps away the intensity of the disk of the sun and focuses on the atmosphere around the sun. Cam we will be needing some camera modifications for the solar corona photography experiment, again because of the intensity of the disk of the sun. So what I'm planning to do is use a shadow for the camera to block off the disk, but then again the size of the shadow will need to be determined and this might need flying multiple payloads and just observing the general trend. There is a possibility of using filters just to cut down the light, but that would come up with a new problem because what we want to observe is the relatively faint part of the sun, and using filters would even make the faint part fainter. So that is a problem we need to deal with and something we need to think about more. We may try shooting in ultraviolet or infrared light, since I've been doing some research on the Lasco and Soho observatories, and they seem to have done a pretty good job in ultraviolet and infrared light. The atmospheric spectroscopy project in Wall entails studying the wavelengths in the Earth's atmosphere, some which are emitted by the sun, and even absorbed in the atmosphere before they reach the Earth. This process can get complicated because of the same reason that certain wavelengths are absorbed by the sun's atmosphere and never reach the Earth's atmosphere atmosphere in the first place. And on the other hand, some of these wavelengths are absorbed in the Earth's atmosphere and never reach the ground. This diagram gives a 
brief overview of the solar radiation spectrum. And the visible light spectrum is a considerable, considerably small part of the whole spectrum. So we may consider taking an infrared spectrograph for this, since the infrared spectrum is much larger than the visible light spectrum. The spectrograph will be built using plans published in the Make magazine and requires very simple material like the ABS plastic pipe, construction, and black, black construction paper and cardboard, and holographic film and diffraction grading, which are very, very easy to get. Now, the spectroscope will be modified into a spectrograph by having a camera, which would be programmed to take pictures, again, to capture those spectro spectrums every 30 seconds or so in the atmosphere. And like any project, this project would entail certain challenges. So right now, we aren't clear whether we will need to deal with the active swinging and spinning of the payload during the flight. If temporary pointing in the direction of the sun will suffice, then I may not need an active pointing mechanism for this experiment. Previous experiments in high ballooning have shown that such mechanisms cease to function properly in the extreme conditions of near space. But if precision and precision pointing will be required and longer time exposures in the direction of the sun will be required, then I may need to come up with an active pointing mechanism. The possibilities are using linear actuators to come up with a rotating mechanism to the camera. And for this, I might need the help of some other members of the ballooning team who have much more experience in interface systems and electronics. The relevance of this project is that solar corona and corona mass ejections, space weather, and the solar wind have a lot of effect on the Earth's atmosphere. These can cause disturbances and even cause uh, enlargement of the Earth's atmosphere, which increases dra atmospheric drag on low Earth orbit vehicles. The spectroscopy project is interesting because it helps us provide a new research avenue on and dwell upon what is the composition of certain elements because spectroscopy is widely used to determine the composition of various elements using wavelengths of known elements and comparing them to the wavelengths of known substances. I would like to acknowledge a few people who have been of constant guidance and support in this project and the upcoming project. And one of them is my faculty mentor, Dr. James Slotten, student members of the High Altitude Ballooning Team at the University of Minnesota, the Minnesota Space Grant Consortium for funding the freshman seminar project, and the University of Minnesota for providing funding for the UROP. If you have any questions, I'm willing to answer them. <laughs>